So hello everyone and welcome to today's community conversation with Berryba Land Trust, where we'll be focusing on our local food system in Nevada County and the challenges and opportunities related to the future of food with insights shared by our guest panelists. My name is Erica Seward of Berryba Land Trust, joined also by Aaron Tarr, if you can wait, uh, raise your hand, where we both serve as co-executive directors I'll be moderating today's chat with Aaron speaking on behalf of the organization. And we are both very excited to be welcoming our guests today who represent various aspects of our local food system. So with that, um, I'd love it if we could just go around the virtual room and each introduce ourselves and the business or organization that you represent. And let's go ahead and start with Molly. Hey everybody, Molly Nakahara. I'm the Farm Institute Director at Sierra Harvest. I'm also a farmer. I have a farm called Dinner Bell Farm. Um, yeah, excited to be here with you all today and um, look forward to this conversation. Chris, Rebecca, you want to jump in? Sure. My name is Chris Marr. I'm the General Manager at the Briar Patch Co-op in Grass Valley. We're uh, co-op is owned by 8,000 or so of our local community members and has a particular focus on uh, selling and supporting local foods. And I'm Rebecca Torpy. I'm the marketing manager at Briar Patch, and we're actually up to 9,000 owners now. Happy to be here. Nice. John. Hi, I'm John Teclin, and I'm the owner and general manager of Mountain Bounty Farm. And, uh, we're one of the main organic farms in Nevada County. And Will. Hey, y'all. I'm Will Holland, and I'm co owner of Fog Dog Farm with my partner, Kristen Draz. We started in Nevada County in 2016 together and recently moved to El Dorado County in 2019. This will be our second year here um, and we were able to secure a long-term lease with a separate, um, the American River Conservancy um, conservation nonprofit, which is really exciting, dovetails with our conversation today. And I'm a second generation market gardener with a long term interest in food and consider like my work in agriculture. Um, I'm hoping to be a part of building a long term sustainable food system that we haven't seen yet. So I love getting the opportunity to participate with y'all and I know you are doing work and have done. Thanks. And hi there, I'm Erin Tarr, uh, the other co-executive director of Bear Yuba Land Trust. And we're really excited to um, have all these partners here. Really, what we're going to be talking about today was an outcome of, of what we've heard from our community and what we've heard from our farmers and needs that, that have arisen here. So really, really excited to talk more about that. Awesome. So, um, you know, in terms of food that we all love so much. Um, I'd love to go around the room and just hear um, how and hear more about what food means to you. And so you can talk about what it means to your organization, but even more so personally, uh, kind of open it up regarding that. Who wants to start? John. Uh, me, um... Yeah, so um, I think that's a great uh, jumping off point. Um, food for me is uh, very, it's very personal. Obviously I'm putting a lot of food out into the community. We're now feeding, you know, over 800 families. Um, but um, I, I got into this because of the pleasure of eating. And I think that's really important to keep in mind that what, what food is about eating and people coming together with their families. And um, I, I just really revel in that. Um, crunching into a new radish that we just picked yesterday or 
you know, hearing from people about how much they, how much it means to them and how much they get out of eating fresh, high quality food that tastes good. I mean, that's just, that's really great. So I think, I think that's for me, it's a, it's a, it's a personal thing. And it's about what, how it feels. Absolutely. And uh, before I go around to the rest of the group to um, hear your thoughts, uh, I wanted to remind our attendees today that there is a Q&A uh, button that you can press on the bottom of the screen where you can actually uh, submit your questions for the group that we're going to be um, um, uh, opening up uh, to the group later on. And then um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what food means to you um, throughout the conversation. So um, we'll kick it over to Molly. Great. So um, our, the mission of Sierra Harvest is to transform lives and strengthen community through fresh local seasonal food. So we see food as um, the cornerstone and the key piece to personal health and community health. And um, we, we love the idea that food is something that brings us all together. It's something that we all share together. Um, and like John was saying, there's so much joy in food and there's so much celebration in food. And, um, and it also is this essential piece to all of our lives. And so, so food is this critical component of what we view as a healthy, healthy community. Um, and, you know, on a personal note, I, I find food is something that helps me um, connect with the planet and to connect with my body and um, you know the act of growing food is is a sort of medicine to me and um, I think that's a really beautiful piece of food and local food as well. Well I love big questions. Uh, what does food mean to me? Um, so I've been thinking a lot the last couple of years about nourishment as a concept and I would food is the physical form of nourishment um, and I really resonate with what John and Molly have shared so far and I also re have recognized over the years of working in agriculture that my sort of like farm owner trajectory isn't super common um, I really come to like local sustainable food from a place of lack and not having that access. Um, even though I was a second, I'm a second generation market gardener, even the like cultural inheritance of like how we relate to food wasn't present in my early experiences. And so, um, yeah, food is, <laughs> as Molly said, you know, it's essential. We're seeing that even more in this like COVID time, you know, food workers are considered essential workers. Um, it's pretty, it's almost so basic to be taken for granted that we need food. And then I have found that the food that I really need wasn't available to me for so much of my life. And then also continues to be challenging to access for more, a lot of people. Um, so food to me is this window into uh, how to build nourishment beyond physical nourishment, which is the relationship and the interconnectedness. So I, would, I guess to try to make that more succinct, I'd say food is my entry to how I start to re-explore my relationship to where food comes from, how other people are accessing food, and then hopefully, um, expanding that terrain where food is a joy for more and more people and is more nourishing. Um, so basically it's what my life is centered around. Um, and I, I get a lot of, I feel a lot of responsibility around food um, and potential and joy, but also grief and, and, and sadness and mourning. Um, thank you. Uh, Chris? I think that I, the, so much of what has been said is exactly how I feel about it. Um, 
it's really about building community. Um, it's the way we gather both in our houses and uh, as a town and as a, a region. Um, it's an opportunity for us to, like Molly said, connect with the planet, connect with our bodies, um, to become educated, to become empowered. Um, it's, uh, it's, I enjoy being a part of the food system because it brings people of all different backgrounds together to experience something as a community or as a family that we all do and that it's that it, it takes it filters out what we what separates us and what makes us different and uh, gives us an opportunity to connect. Rebecca. Wow, so much has already been said already. I'm not really sure what to how to build on that. But, um, you know, ever since I've been a little kid, food has always been this means of being able to travel to other places from the comfort of our dinner table. So um, I guess, you know, from my perspective, food is this means of shared understanding. And I think in this current climate that we're in of divisiveness and uncertainty and chaos and isolation, we have this opportunity to be able to use food as this space of common appreciation, you know, appreciation for the people who produce it and the people who make it and also the people that, you know, we get a chance to have Zoom dinners with and the people who we have dinners at our dinner tables with right now. So, you know, it's, um, not only, you know, is it a, a sustenance thing for our bodies, but food also has this power to be able to grow our minds in amazing ways too, like everybody's already said. Erin. Um, yeah, um, I, from an organizational perspective, from the land trust perspective, I think Food security has been something that we've talked about for years. We just had our 30th anniversary. Um, we've always been, been part of our mission to be protecting working lands. How we've done that historically has been mostly through rangelands and through really large, um, large grazing operations are, are what we've protected a lot of. Um, what we haven't protected a lot of is farmland. We, we really hadn't, didn't have a model yet set up to be able to protect smaller land and now we're moving into that where we're creating these new models and it's really exciting to see. I mean, I feel like for Barriuba Land Trust, our role here is to provide land security so that our community can have food security. And we're relying on our partners and we're relying on the farmers to, to be able to do that. But what we can do is provide affordable land to farmers um, to provide some permanence here. And then um, on a personal level, like Molly said, um, you know, food really is medicine. I mean, what we put in our bodies is so important to our well-being. So, you know, healthy food, healthy soil, healthy community, healthy planet. And I see that there's, there's this direct linkage there. And I was lucky to um, get in on the CSA boxes with Mountain Bounty Farm right before the wait list uh, started after this pandemic. So that has been something that with my children at home now, not only are we spending a lot more time together and connecting on all sorts of different levels, but now we have the CSA box. They are so excited every Wednesday to go get that box, see what's in it, and then try these new, these new things. And we're cooking as a family. And so that connection has been, has been huge. Um, well, I will say, so what's already been shared by so many is how I feel as well. And, um, you know, it's uh, very well put with our position and land trust around food and food. But on a more personal note, um, uh, in recent years, I've experienced some health issues. And so food has become very personal to me. Um, and I think it's a very personal thing to so many of us. And, um, you know, it, it is life-giving. Uh, it is medicine. It is, um, you know, it is, it is energy. And the more that we invest as people and as a community and putting food at the center of how um, we shape our priorities and um, our, our future, you know, it's all there for us if, if we can, you know, look at it uh, through that lens. And so 
it is a lot as a community about resilience and, and connection and gathering and honoring all the different facets of, of what it really takes uh, within this complex system to, to move forward um, united around that. And so um, I think it's a, a good way um, to now enter this sort of next part of the conversation is talking about what um, uh, our local food system is all about. And so um, Molly, if you could share an overview of that to kind of educate our um, uh, viewers uh, today around um, the local food economy and all the different facets of it. So. Great, yeah, thanks Erica. And thanks everyone for sharing. Something that struck me while we were speaking was that food, food is also about sort of choice and with that choice, a lot of responsibility. And I certainly feel that as someone who raises livestock, you know, there's, you can treat your animals well or you can treat your animals poorly. And I think making those choices are, are um, in, in how we look at food are really, really significant. And that's how sort of all of this stuff comes into place. So all of this stuff, that's our food system. And so I wanted to share a little bit about a project that Sierra Harvest has been doing. Um, in, um, in 2015, uh, with a bunch of diverse stakeholders, we created, we came together and have created the Nevada County Food Policy Council. Um, I think a lot of, most of you are all members of that Food Policy Council. Um, and, and that Food Policy Council is on the steering committee for a larger statewide organization called the California Food and Farming Network. Um, and, and the Food Policy Council set out in 2015 to do an assessment of Nevada County's food system. So what does that mean? What's a food system? A food system encompasses all of the stages of, of keeping us fed. So from growing, harvesting, packing, processing, transforming, marketing, delivering, consuming, and even sort of composting and the disposing of food waste. So that whole picture of food um, and how it gets to from, from a farm um, or a ranch to the end user, that, that all of those pieces together are um, our food system. And so we, we knew, we had some ideas, we had some thoughts around what the food system was like. We had some guesses, but we, we really needed to establish a baseline. And so this is what is, this food system assessment is helping us sort of say like, okay, here is where we're at in terms of the way that food gets to Nevada, Nevada County, the way it's grown, the way it moves around. Um, and we're gonna be publishing this big, amazing and beautiful food system assessment this year. We're really excited to be sharing that with the community. Um, and uh, I'm gonna share a little bit about that. So um, that some of the findings that we've, that we've found. Um, so a food system assessment is sort of, like I said, looking at that baseline, um, sort of determining where we're at so that we can sort of decide where to go from here and measure the changes that maybe would be made um, as a result of all of our efforts. Um, so, Let's see, what, what, what does the Nevada County food system look like? Well, to start off, we've sort of zeroed in on a number, the total food purchases that happen in Nevada County, and they are about $382 million. Oh, that's a lot of money. So on an annual basis, that's how much money is spent on food in Nevada County. Um, so then we looked, wanted to know sort of, okay, how much of our food is being produced? By local farmers and ranchers in our community. And, and what we found um, is that right now we're at about $12 million annually produced in livestock and $2 million produced in food crops. So, um, so if you take that number, that's about 14 million of local production, right? And, and out of that bigger giant number, 382 million, Local production accounts for about three and a half percent of all of the food that's consumed in Nevada County. Um, so that's not a very big piece. It's, a, it's, it's great, it's a lot. And thank you farmers who do it. That's a lot of work. Um, but what we, what we see is that we've got, we've got a lot of room to grow. We've got a lot of room to grow if we wanna, if we wanna get more local seasonal fresh food into, um, the homes and onto the tables of our community members. And there's a lot of reasons why we think that local food 
is a really important piece of, of the food that people eat. Of course, there's always gonna be stuff that's coming from outside imported food, but, but we, we really know that, like we said, the resiliency of our community, um, that our local food producers have a big role to play in that. So um, that sort of is where we're at right now in terms of what's being produced in our community. Um, a couple more statistics that I could share um, about that. We are really lucky in our community because we have quite a few um, beginning farmers and young farmers. So um, since 2012, um, we have almost doubled the number of farmers that are under the age of 35 in our community. Um, it's almost 13% of farmers are now um, under the age of 35. And as some people might know, um, the average age of farmers in the United States is 58. And so, you know, that's something people look at, like what, what's gonna happen when all those farmers wanna retire? Who's gonna grow our food? And so it's a, it's a really important and positive sign that we've got. Um, we have more and more young farmers in our community. Um, another sort of thing to note about, um, the farms in our community, um, we've, with the help of, with the help of our partners at Cooperative Extension, we've kind of tried to zero in on what does it take for a farmer to, to uh, make, to make it, to be, to be a successful farm, and, and right now it looks like farms need to be earning a certain amount of money in order to pay themselves somewhat of a living wage, um, and we're really at a situ in a situation where not as many farms in our community are able to do that. So, so farms need to probably earn somewhere around $200,000 a year in order to pay themselves, you know, $35,000 a year. Um, and, and the recent um, crop report, so the Nevada County Ag Department does this really great crop report. You can find it on um, the Nevada County website. Um, and it's kind of a look at agriculture and, uh, year to year. And right now we have about 29 farms in our community that make over $100,000. So we need more farmers is what those numbers are telling me. Um, so Erica, are there other things that um, I could share about our food system assessment? It, there's a well, lot of detail in it, but I kind of wanted to- I think maybe that'll kind of come out as we um, go around and we're getting some questions now coming through too. So. Um, you know, I, maybe we can open it up to the group then to talk about access, production, and distribution. So the kind of the three pillars of a, a food um, system and, um, uh, you know, the role that you all play, um, you know, in, in each of those key areas. So it all starts with our farmers. So I'd love to hear from uh, both of you about um, how you all participate in the, in the food system and, and some of the the things that you're seeing um, that relate to kind of what um, Molly has shared with um, production and um, access and, and um, you know, just the demographics as a whole and, and where it's headed. So Will, why, why, don't, uh, why don't you start? Well, thank you for sharing that data, Molly. And I'm really stoked that the Food Policy Council exists and that work is being done. Um, I believe, just to highlight its importance, I do believe that one of the major um, gaps in our expansion of the local food system is like the macro view and you know, the existing industrial food system is a planned economy with a lot of infrastructure and subsidies and entrenchment and backroom deals. And, and that's not even a conspiracy. I mean, it's all a, like it's it's a planned thing. Um, it's very important that people get fed. <laughs> um, and if we want to have any success in creating a regenerative option in the marketplace, I really believe we need to take a broader, longer term view that incorporates a lot of these elements beyond individual farms, um, which would be, you know, we have major redundancies in all of those things around storage, processing, 
shipping. Like all of our farms are responsible for figuring out how to do everything for themselves over and over again. Um, I would also suggest that, you know, I don't know how to fix it and it can sometimes be hard to bring up problems without immediate solutions. But um, oftentimes, and I've heard other really vocal folks in this sector talking about how um, they use the number one four hundredth, but it sounds like maybe we're 18, 380 seconds of the market share. And we end up in a position where we're fighting over it because we're in the same farmer's markets or we're at the same restaurants or we're, we're marketing to the same CSA customers as opposed to having some sort of facilitated way of expanding the market share. As producers, we end up, I mean, to use a, a crass term, cannibalizing each other. And I believe that that is also what younger up and coming farmers, you know, people that make it, <laughs> end up being really good because they have to be, because they have to kind of on their own find some way to get access, maintain that access, and also either, you know, take somebody else's existent market base or create a whole new one. And we don't have a lot of broad support for that in the infrastructure, in the programs, and also like this data and where to even look, you know, new producers are just making that up as we can in, kind of in the dark. Um, and then I just, the cost of land is insane for anybody that doesn't already own it or um, have some access to capital. Like I said, I, I, I really feel um, proud that my partner and I have made it as far as we have because we didn't have any money. I'm lucky that I had land in my family so I could keep sharpening my own tools but I didn't have enough access to capital to make that $200,000 farm until like last year. And I'm, we're still not there. And it's taken a whole lot of us make paying opportunity costs that I wouldn't ask other people to pay like flat out, like it's ridiculous. And so I'm super committed to these conversations and that broader work. Cause I don't want it to be as hard for anybody after me as it has been for me to become a farmer. And I think that as a community, as people, as a society, we could do a much better job of rising to that occasion, period. Like, Absolutely. Uh, um, and well, and John, you've been, you're a success story, um, you know, being in, in business for as long as you have. Um, could you talk uh, a little bit about um, Will's point about the um, importance of sharing resources and the work that you've been doing to mentor and guide and um, be an anchor within the community and, and seeing um, others thrive within the, within the county. Yeah, I really appreciate hearing um, what you're saying, Will, about how hard it is to get started and how you don't want someone else to have to go through what, what you went through. I guess I've just kind of gotten old enough that I've forgotten now, but um, uh, or blanked it out or whatever, but um, it was the same thing for me with, you know, the first 15 years was like living on $10,000 a year. And now no one even thinks, no one would do it. None of my employees will accept that as, a, as an even a, a lifestyle choice. Um, so, but I also want to acknowledge like that things are different now. So like, you know, like you were saying, well, like we have to, we had to create, we have to create our own everything from scratch. It's like now a lot of these groundworks have been laid. Like look what Briar Patch has created. They've built this marketplace, right? So it's a template that can be expanded. And, you know, we've been talking with Sierra Harvest about why couldn't there be other people doing like what Briar Patch is doing, building more markets. Um, and and so, you know, like when we started trying to do a CSA here, people didn't even know what a CSA was. And now there's this like overwhelming demand and all these other farms are starting CSAs. And so I think that there's, it's just a, it's just kind of like a slow thing. And the other thing I want to say is just about the whole like, how, what our percentage production versus consumption in this county is like, I, I think we should be careful about trying to assume that we can do it all or even dream that we can do it all. We live in a, 
connected society, and I think that that's okay. I mean, even back in indigenous times, people traded for salt, they traded for obsidian. They, you know, it's okay to get potatoes from the valley, I think, or to get things from our nearby regional neighbors. You know, someone can grow wheat in the high desert better than we can, or whatever. So, um, I think it's really great how far we've come. I, I mean, I see all the lacks in places where we need to go, but it's like, you know, I think it's it's worth thinking about um, not feeling crushed by our small numbers, but like, like look, look how far we've come and what are our opportunities. And one of the great opportunities I see is like just trying to maximize the farmland we do have. So we, we have very little farmland and like Will says, it's super expensive. I own one acre of farmland of the 20 acres I farm. I've been farming for 25 years, at least tons and tons of places. It's been a complete nightmare. I've been kicked off, I don't know how many different places and after I put tons of money into them and all that. It's been it's been a career of heartbreak essentially until now when the Variable Land Trust working with Briar Patch and Fair Harvest are now working on this Forever Farms program where they're looking at one of our main sites and trying to secure it for the community. Not for us, not for Mountain Bounty so we can whatever, save us, but as a community farm and um, I see that as incredibly hopeful and, um, you know, maybe in a generation there will be a whole long list of these farms um, that we're starting to carve out from our local landscape. Um, it is tough here. We don't have that much farmland and the farmland we have isn't that great. We don't have that much water, but we do have some of these gems that can be, um, can be utilized. So the, the basic bottom line, I think, to getting more farming happening here is Securing that land with the basic infrastructure so farmers can, can get started. The farmers who don't have capital can come in and just do what they need to do. And so that means water infrastructure and fencing, essentially. That's the base. And I think that if um, you know this Forever Farms program can continue um, and provide acreages, a whole network of acreages like that, um, that would that would be a a great, a great so um, we're going to talk about Forever Farms here in um, just a minute or so and um, throw it over to Aaron to, to kick that off. But we do have a question about, um, to John's point, about local food and how much is produced locally um, versus statewide and, and where we're sourcing our food. So I think um, uh, the Briar Patch could probably speak to that. Um, uh, in the business that, that they, they have and just um, where we're getting our food in the supply chains. And so, Chris, if you could speak to um, the work that you do within the local food system and then uh, specifically around our current situation uh, with, with COVID and then um, community resilience with this crisis, but you know, inevitably there'll be future crises. Um, uh, it's just the world that we live in with um, climate change and um, all that stuff. But if you could speak to, again, the, the local food supply, um, where you're seeing stresses in the business that you run and um, the role that you play within the local food system. And then we're going to go over uh, to Aaron to talk about the land trust in Forever Farm. Um, well, that's a, that's a big topic, um, starting from kind of where you ended the question, the role that Briar Patch plays in the food system here is uh, one of connection with folks who eat food, folks who um, really spend, in some cases, no time thinking about farms or where their food is produced and don't ask these questions. And I think that that really gets at the heart of the future of what our role can and should be, which is to educate people about all of these big questions. Um, Will spoke a second ago to the subsidies that exist in the conventional uh, part of the industry, and I think that that is a huge topic to really start to peel back and find ways to make accessible for people um, as they understand what the food system is and why a project like this is very much not about saving a farm or farms at all. It's about taking an entirely transformative approach to 
uh, how we think about the food that we eat and how we produce it locally, whether we're trying to produce um, as much as we can, as high a variety as we can here locally, or we're focusing on um, just the select things that are uh, proven successful in the area. Consumers are detached from the food system, and the, the real cost of food is obscured from most people. And I think that as a consumer-owned co-op, our goal is not to step in and take action on behalf of consumers so that they can remain in that uh, state of existence, but to play a role to connect producers, distributors, everybody that's involved with consumers so that we can understand each other, ask these questions, and develop strategies to make that transformation happen. And that really builds to the other part of the question that you were asking, Erica, which is how are how do we become more resilient? Well, we're empowered in part by having food, simply being able to eat and know that we have some level of security, and also we're empowered by information. And what has happened um, in the short term here around the COVID outbreak, uh, and I think is on full display inside of our store, is that as a small locally owned co-op, you know, we feel big most of the time, but uh, in the context of the food industry, we are able to be in touch with people, whether it's our producers, our vendors, our service providers, or just the people who shop there, understand what's happening, not just on a daily basis, but on an hourly basis as we went through this, and make adjustments to how we operate and how we show up for all those people. And that's, that's what this is all about. That's what bringing together people in conversation uh, seeks to accomplish. So, I mean, I think that that's true of what Briar Patch's role is in this, but I don't think that that's ultimately really unique for any of the folks who's, who are on this call. Well, it's certainly brought into um, more focus, I think, within the community about the importance of food and the urgency around either growing your own um, and uh, thanks to Molly, she did post in the in the chat box um, a link to how to how to do that and resources that um, Sierra Harvest is providing, as well as direct connections to our, our farmers and um, other resources as well. Um, but then also, you know, how do we plan around the future? And land is a big part of that. And so, Aaron, if you could speak to um, Bear Yuba Land Trust and the role that we play within the food system as it relates to land, and then introduce uh, Forever Farms to those um, watching today. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned before, a lot of our work to date has been around conservation of uh, working rangelands. So we've got over 6,000 acres protected um, in the South County and Western County area and in Eba County. Um, the one cropland that we that we do have is uh, the Sierra Harvest Food Love Project. So probably about 10 years ago, Living Lands Agrarian Network was still um, around and they were knocking on doors trying to find farmland to lease and they, they came to us at our Burton Homestead and uh, we, we've been we were under a lease with them for the last 10 years before we transferred that property. They had a quarter acre um, garden that was just highly productive. And also the, the great thing about it was that it brought so many students um, every year to the farm to really show them about uh, growing food. So, so that's kind of been our historic role in the food system. We work a lot with um, the grazer that we work with a lot is Jim Gates at Nevada County Free Range Beef. Um, that's a, that's a really positive relationship for us because of his local market and because he is really uh, self-contained. And throughout this pandemic, even he has been able to continue to provide um, product to the local grocery stores and local consumers where a lot of other cattle producers are, are really seeing the market fall out from under them. But he's, he's created this uh, self-sustained market that's, that's great to see. But um, moving forward, the Forever Farms program um, that whole concept really came uh, from Will. <laughs> I'm going to give him credit for this one because <laughs> we were contacted by some concerned citizens. You know, they were, Will, Will was part of it. They were looking for land at that time. I think 
correct me if I'm wrong, Will, but you had a month to month lease for your farm up on the ridge. Um, which right. clearly, Definitely. yeah, yeah, it's just, it's not sustainable for, for anyone. When we started hearing um, the stories of other farms and how they were at risk of losing their land, farmers are leaving our community, what, what can the land trust do? And this model has, has been very successful throughout the country. Um, it's something that we've been looking at for a long time and contemplating, and this really propelled us to, to take action. And, and then the, these wonderful partners um, came into the fold, the Sierra Harvest and Briar Patch, and, and we started unifying around this common goal that we need, to, we need to find a way to keep farmers here. And one of the major issues is that, that farm uh, the land access. So how do you invest in a land? How do you find permanence on a land when you're on a month to month or even a year to year lease, not knowing if, if you're going to be there with farming, that's just impossible. So um, right now, um, you know, the, the Land for Farms work group turned into this Forever Farms program. We've already um, claimed some of our, our projects are Forever Farms. We have Kramer Ranch that's out on South Auburn Road, an 84 acre uh, working ranch, they've got cattle and sheep and um, gardens. Uh, and we have Lyndon Lee Ranch, which is out on Bitney Springs. It's about 800 acres, another uh, working cattle ranch. So these are forever farms. Our, our, um, our mission is in perpetuity. So we're protecting these lands forever. Conservation easements go on forever. We also own land. That's the model that we're looking at with Mountain Bounty is actually um, purchasing the land from the current landowner. This is the, the most productive site that Mountain Bounty grows on up on uh, Birchville Road. So purchasing that land and then being able to lease it back to the farmer, but also giving them access to the barn that's on site that they haven't had access to, as well as potentially the home um, for, for farm worker housing. So um, this is just one you know, this is kind of our pilot project, providing this community asset forever that will always be available for agriculture, regardless of if Mountain Bounty's there or in the future, if it's, if it's other farmers. They've invested so much into the land, um, $150,000 in investments in the water infrastructure and the, the soils have been built up. So protecting what exists is something that's, that's really important, um, as well as, you know, other models under the Forever Farms program could be investing in degraded farmland and bringing that back up into production or um, conservation easements working with a farmer that wants to purchase land we're able to purchase the conservation easement and then it's a reduced price for that farmer to get that access to the land um, there was an article that just came out today I, I read it from conservation finance network about investments in regenerative agriculture um, which I'll, I'll post on the chat here after i'm done talking but something like 40% of farmers are um, going to be retiring soon and that, that land is going to be transitioning and they're looking for the highest dollar um, so that they can fund their retirement. So um, that, that makes it really hard for young markers, at, young farmers entering the market. Um, I'll leave it there. So, so, so land access and land security are key. Um, John, could you talk about what this, um, project means to you uh, um, and being the first for Forever Farms under this model that we're pursuing? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's huge for us. I mean, we're, um, like I said before, we're, um, we have this long history of desperately looking for land. Um, that The lease on that property expires at the end of this year. And it's, uh, it, it's unclear whether, even now, whether the land would um, renew that lease. Um, and so this is like, it's kind of like a live or die thing for us. Um, but, but beyond that, I think it's really um, interesting what Aaron was saying about um, a farmland in perpetuity. So where all, this, all these properties that are, um, that are going to be inherited by somebody, or they're gonna be somebody's retirement uh, with farmers that are retiring or landowners that haven't farmed their land that are going to transition it to some other use. Um, I think it's really, really inspiring. This is kind of one of the most inspiring things that I've, I've come across in, in many years of my farming career. The idea that we could remove farmland from that system, from the system of inheritance 
or retirement um, to where it's, it's outside of that, that stream of capital. It's, it's something that's a community resource. Then. It's actually for the purpose of feeding the community. That's what that land is. It's kind of like a, what the purpose of a park or open space is for a community. Um, and that just is just like the, there's a boundless potential there for me. Um, so I'm I'm really I'm really thrilled by that. Um, in the same way that I I see like the CSA model is kind of getting outside that um, that marketplace that Will was talking about, where it's all about subsidies and these crushingly large systems that are meant to make it not work for people like us. Um, well, if we can if we can sidestep that and create our own new system where we work directly with community members and, and uh, anyhow, I, I just find it really important. Well, I think what you're speaking to is um, being more inclusive and um, Molly, we were talking about that before this, this call today. Can you um, speak a little bit to that point and how um, there is an opportunity around that? Sure. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. So the Forever Farms program is incredibly exciting. It's <clears throat> amazing to think that we as a community could make the choice to, to really um, ensure the longevity of local food production by making sure that land is <clears throat> available to farmers, both farmers who want to secure existing businesses um, and expand existing businesses and for new farmers who want to enter into our local food production. So this is just a critical piece and it's really exciting that we're all coming together to do this. Um, and just to, to touch on the, I, this notion of equity, um, you know, we, the new fam, the new beginning farmer is, is, um, it's a sort of an anomaly. We, we don't have a lot of um, farmers who have come from farming back. We have a lot of farmers who've come from farming backgrounds, but we also have a lot of farmers who are sort of this, this new family farm who don't have a history of agriculture and land in their families. And we wanna make sure that um, farmers in our community are have equitable access to land and that we are um, making sure that we are looking at all the projects that come across the Forever Farms um, doorstep. Um, we're looking at them through a lens to make sure that we're really uh, treating farmers all the same and that, and that everyone's gonna have sort of equal access. And that's gonna be a big focus of the work that Sierra Harvest does in the coming um, years to, as this program grows, is, is really looking at some other models um, that are working across the country. Um, how do people select farms and projects how do other organizations make sure that um, there's equal access to this type of program? Um, and so that's that's a big focus of, of the work that CR Harvest will do. So, so that we are sure that we're addressing sort of the projects of immediate need um, and that we're also sort of aware of all the need that's in the community. And I know that it's written into your strategic plan and to, to ours as well, which is our guiding documents for organizations. Um, we did have a question here from Aubrey, and she wanted to know, Aaron, how do you craft it into an easement that land will remain um, in agricultural production? So oh, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, we have a, a tool called an agricultural conservation easement. Um, so in those easements, you can't, you can't require that agriculture is always on the land, but you also can't restrict agriculture from the land. So you know, when we're doing these documents in perpetuity, we don't know in 100 years what the landscape is going to look like. So you can't make that a strict requirement. But in the agricultural conservation easements, it is, it is something that, um, that we're looking for to, to be occurring on the land. And if it's not, and if it's possible, then we work with the landowner to ensure that, that it is continuing. Um, Rebecca, so um, in terms of Forever Farms, um, how do you see uh, the, the partnership kind of um, uh, being of, uh, let me reframe that. So in terms of the partnership itself, what do you see the potential um, as within that um, sitting um, in the third tier as far as uh, Briar Patch? So one of three partners that are committed to this. And then if you could also speak to 
uh, your membership base um, and how they can become involved with this initiative and um, where you see the connections there. Sure. Um, well, you know, being a partner is such a great opportunity because we have an op we have a wonderful opportunity to be a support in terms of outreach and promotion of the Forever Farms program. Um, we've got an awesome um, communications arm and a wonderful um, way to support um, Bear Yuba and Sierra Harvest and the whole partnership. So, you know, in terms of being able to promote the farmers themselves and, um, you know, be able to also fundraise as well through our ownership is huge. And um, I also want to mention too that our election is coming up um, next week and it starts on May 1st. And um, we thought we would have a little fun. And for every vote, um, we will be donating $2 to the Forever Farms program. And no, that's not a bribe. Um, but uh, we really felt that it would be this great opportunity to mobilize people to really focus on the um, local food supply through two different venues, the Forever Farms program, and that really focuses on the food production aspect, which is super important, but also the piece about democracy and participating in the governance of the local food co-op because the people that you're voting for are the people who are really developing the strategic vision behind the behind the co-op. So, you know, it's really important and really fun. So we hope that people participate in the election this week. How, so how many members do you have? 9,100, I think at this point. Wow. <laughs> so if everyone uh, voted, we could uh, fundraise a significant amount, huh? For sure. <laughs> Um, Will dropped off for a second, so now he's back on. Um, we only have a, a couple more minutes left, and so um, if Will, can you can you hear us? We'll wait for him to to get fully back on the screen here. Um, so I'd like to kind of um, we've gone through some of the the questions here today, and um, just to, to remind everyone that's joining us, um, we are recording this and so um, we have a note section that will accompany the, the recording. So you'll be able to find links uh, to each of the organizations and businesses that are represented here. So Briar Patch, Sierra Harvest, Mountain Bounty Farm, Fog Dog Farm, and then uh, Bear Yuba Land Trust. We also have a link to the Forever Farms page where you can donate in support of uh, this um, community initiative, bylt.org uh, forward slash Forever Farms. I'd love to um, throw it to Will as one of the, the founding members of this program to talk about, um, again, the issue of inclusivity and um, the potential that you see within this program. I know we talked about it at a farmer's market um, off to the side one day um, before this whole COVID thing went down. So I'd love to throw it to you with some parting thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, and I apologize. Uh, I mentioned in the email, uh, Zoom meetings aren't my forte. <laughs> I'm much better <laughs> out scratching around in the dirt. So I, I dropped out and um, I'll go back and watch what Molly said because I was really excited to hear. Um, yeah, a few things. One, I'm so honored to hear Aaron and Erica and everybody give us the cre some credit for the beginning of this project. That's that's really, um, I don't know. I was blushing internally. I know my screen's really dark, so you probably can see it. So I'll, I'll, I'll share that. Um, and part of that is also because, you know, us farmers have a well-earned stereotype of rugged individualism and kind of like self-determination. And, um, you know, I had a moment in our, our crisis, like our least crisis and what was going on where I had a choice, whether I was gonna try to like figure it out, fight it out, be stubborn, be a rugged individualist, or if I was gonna ask for help. And I was really hopeful that, um, of course, that I would get help, but I was even more hopeful that by sharing, it would grow. And I had no control over how much y'all were gonna run with this. And I had, I don't have the skills y'all have, and I just wanna like, 
one honor that whole process for me because it was really big like being able to be a part of it recognize i may only have a small contribution of saying like hey we need help but then also this hope that it would get taken up and be passed along and i i really want to spend a second on that because for me personally that that's how i can make inclusivity happen is by sharing those needs and by not insisting that I'm going to get transactional reward for me necessarily. That's part of, so like mountain bounty getting secure land security is a benefit to me is my shift. I could live in a world of rugged individualism where I only saw John and his great partners in the farm as competition. And then I wouldn't have that same feeling and I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in that food system. And I really think that it has to be an ongoing choice and for everybody. It's not just farmers that make that choice to be super competitive. And oftentimes it comes from real places of like real financial scarcity or perceived scarcity. Um, and it's sometimes really hard to tell the difference between real and perceived scarcity, especially <laughs> if you're stressed and things are really hard. So I just want to throw that out there as part of like my personal experience of how I can do the work of, yeah, being inclusive or, you know, being a part of joining kind of this broader vision, this paying forward ideally like a reciprocal economy. I think another huge thing that comes up for me in this, that again, is kind of a big thing that might be hard to bring up, but it's just really important for me. Um, some of this work is undoing bad choices of the past. And it would be ridiculous for me to take any credit for an idea of like a commons, because historically those have existed. And there's an even deep, more deeply entrenched history on this land of an active privatization of productive landscapes that, you know, um, it's, it's just not the best way to build a stable food system, I think we're finding. And it, that's not a value judgment. I, I'm really trying to approach it as just like, how are my, how are my future generations going to get fed? And I believe programs like this are an answer that has more longevity. Um, so I, I believe like looking at the food system on a bigger level and using historical, <laughs> the history of the decisions that have gotten made around food production, some of this work is, amends or reparations base to me we can kind of undo some mistakes and i think we're all the beneficiaries of those mistakes um like i said i really come to this whole work from a place of lack despite my privilege i can really see myself in the picture of need need for access like my cultural access to food got disrupted at some point in history. My access to like a commons got disrupted in history. And those are things that I wanna be a part of rebuilding for everybody. Because I think we all as people really thrive in places of connection to nourishment. We, we really thrive in garden spaces, like picking fruit, ripe fruit off a tree is a high joy. <laughs> for like who we are as biological, but also as spiritual and social beings. Um, that's as close to a universal I've experienced um, on a personal level. So I just wanna say thank you for getting to be a part of this. I hope that kind of tagged in with the inclusivity and, and the direction we were going. Um, and, you know, I think the lenses of um, historical injustice are pertinent around food. And again, that's one of the reasons, you know, to me, food is a portal to the entire human experience. Like um, Wendell Berry, I think, is given credit for saying agriculture is the basis of culture. Um, and it's really a pretty straight through line. You got to eat to do anything else. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I, I think that you kind of summed it up nicely that um, 
food is for all and um, food is love too. So um, we are winding down right now. I just wanna say thank you to everyone um, who joined today. Um, again, this is uh, gonna be available later with links to all of our organizations. And we have one final comment here from Robin Milam, who um, also participated in the Land uh, for Farms work group. So I'm gonna read that right now for, for all to hear. Wonderful dialogue and so grateful to all of you. Because of you and your collective leadership, over the last years I have transformed my relationship with food to experience the sheer joy and nourishment that comes from fresh local organic food. It is now so important to me as well as friends and colleagues to know who's growing our food as well as where and how it is grown. Our local food is all about place and this community we share as home. Forever Farms is grounded in the spirit of cooperation, partnership, and commitment to community resilience and the well-being of our farmers and the land that nur nurtures all. Your leadership is amazing and deeply appreciated. Um, thank you all for being the leaders that you are and uh, we're very excited to see uh, where this all goes based on the shared vision that we all have. So thank you.